this is fun. Yeah, it's fun. It's great to re review the old times. I know. Um, I would love yeah. to know how first how it's all true came to you. Well, Jason and I had had a working relationship on a couple of projects, and uh, prior to that, we did uh, three in the back, two in the head, uh, which we also uh, co-produced with Nestor Angel, my company, and the Tarragon. Uh, about three years prior to It's All True, four years prior to it. And uh, Jason was one of like resident writers at the uh, at Necessary Angel, but he was also a resident writer at Tarragon and he helped facilitate, although we all knew each other, uh, this um, 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 co-production, co-development. So we uh, did that with Three and Back, Two in the Head. That went on to win the Governor General's Award. And uh, I actually had it under consideration for this acoustic. I thought maybe we should be doing that. But it's all true. It's such a fun play about the theater and the making of theater and the passion of making the theater. And it was really the, the play, I thought, that, that kind of spoke to that. I mean, I think in Tarragon's history, it's David French's Jitters, which is about the theater. And, and then it's all true. So I really want to kind of, uh, correct me if I'm wrong. I hope I didn't offend anybody out there. <laughs> I don't remember the other place. So uh, that might be about the theater that Tarragon did. But right. uh, I just felt like this would be a, a, a fun look at the theater, a passion look at the theater. And so uh, Jason came along with this idea about Orson Welles. And that, that night or that day when he uh, 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 found a theater and redid Mark Blitzstein's Cradle of Rock. And it's a very famous incident in the th theatrical lore of Broadway and Orson Welles lore and uh, Mark Blitzstein and uh, theaters trying to operate independently of uh, the government. And so uh, it was a fantastic idea and we supported it and we did workshops and worked on it. And then I think we did you join us in the workshop, I think, Tamara? Were you in the workshop? in workshops, yeah. yeah. Uh, I guess I, I didn't realize it came as an idea. So there was nothing written when it came to you. It was, well, Jason said, I've got this idea. I want to work on this story. And I said, oh, I know the story. It's a great story. And uh, and then he began writing, uh, as is the case. So, you know, we're supporting an idea there for him to go with, go forth. And uh, I was going to ask, what is it about his writing before we get into the actual play of it? But what is it about his writing that appealed to you when you first worked with him? And what is unique about his writing? Well, he not only just writes story, but the way he writes his characters speak to how the story or the themes of the play. And so uh, he's a very um, muscular writer. People use language with intent and use their form of language uh, is with intent. And the form of the scene speaks to partly how the story goes. So you have this opening scene and it's all true where they're talking, overlapping with each other. It's firing at a million miles a minute. No one's listening and no one's everybody's hiding the truth, which is why they can't talk. So they're either full of hesitation or they're, they can't say something, or they don't want to say something that will catch them up, but it's going so fast and Blitzstein is interrogating them, John Houseman and Orson Welles, about what, what they did or didn't do and how it got to this thing today. Uh, and they, 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 they're they trying to lie and they're hesitating and they're doing what I'm doing now. They're kind of hiccuping and uh, uh, they're, they get interrupted and they get challenged every moment. And uh, so you see them hiding the truth. That he just captures that authenticity of how people speak to each other, just as we just did. I just overlapped. I interrupted you, yeah. you know? Yeah. And when they're in a passionate state, uh, when they're really desperate for knowledge or information or whatever they want in the story, uh, Jason can, can get there. Uh, but at the same time, he can write these very beautiful monologues, which are poetic, uh, passionate. Uh, and what I really like about Jason's writing in the end is the contradictions he brings, right? The characters are never um, evil or good. They're never, they're never cliche. They're not um, um, uh, singular or like a cartoon. They're, they're actually complex people with contradiction. And I'm, I'm very drawn to that kind of writing and have been with Jason in the many plays that I've done. He's always up the ante in terms of um, representation of life, I think. And, uh, yeah. And, you know, yeah, he just, it, it, he doesn't let um, the foibles of his characters, he doesn't hide them, he exposes their vulnerabilities. 
and also their de desires and their malevolence, you know, and, and the same thing. So you see them, this struggle that people have uh, with their lives and uh, their own sense of contradiction. So speaking of those characters, I mean, you've, you're creating a, a play that is based on real people. Um, which is always interesting because you can borrow a little bit of history, any research that you do about these characters, some of them were very well known like Orson Welles, and then you have to go out and find the people to play them. And an audience is going to be more discerning because they know the voice of Orson Welles because they've heard it. So how do you, how, how do you go about casting a play that's based on real people? What do you, what do you look for in the character that you try to duplicate in the, uh, find in the actor? Well, one of the things about Jason's writing, and it kind of makes it kind of a little bit easier for a director to cast, is that he kind of writes for actors' voices. So he had everybody in mind, including yourself. I mean, you may have not known that. Um, no, uh, I, I believe he had everybody in mind for the roles. I mean, we discussed some people, uh, uh, but we basically he was writing for, uh, you know, Tom was playing Mark Blitzstein, who he, he knew and worked with before or seen before. Uh, and he went for Victor, who was in a couple of Nessar Angel productions. Then so Jason was aware of him and uh, and his voice, if you like, because really in the way for yeah. representing Wells, although Victor looks a bit like Orson Wells in terms of his facial shape kind of thing and beard and whatnot. Um, at the same time, he also has a kind of voice that can echo the original man, but not be the original man. And so he was, and same with Dick Binsley and yourself and Melody and Martin. Um, it was, uh, he was very aware of the people. So he's kind of always writing to a voice. Now we start in workshop and that even goes even more deeper, if you like, into workshop. So, uh, He's actually, when the actors start acting, he's hearing their rhythms and then he's trying to work off their rhythms to, as the original cast. So, right. so ironically to do this recording as like an original cast recording is kind of perfect because it actually represents the play as he originally intended. So it made it easier to cast. He's got somebody in mind and a voice and a quality he's, you know, um, listening for. And, uh, and then he begins to write. So actors kind of come with the play. Yeah. Um, I want to talk about the workshop process a little bit. You, you touched on that. I, I mean, I have memories of, <laughs> I have memories of being in the room and trying to figure out how to make that dialogue overlap and, and the struggles that Jason was having trying to capture it. And I, I mean, I guess I was pretty young or I won't, maybe was it 20 years ago? Not telling. <laughs> yeah, right. Please don't. Um, <laughs> I just remember there being it's it's such a creative um, room and it's so it's fraught with tension and and creativity and it's really ex an exciting place to be and I remember there being some tensions as you would sort of push him to you know keep relationships in mind and he would go off and into the hallway for uh, you know an hour and you'd say go rewrite that so I guess I'm I'm curious or 20 years ago certainly I was curious as to you know, it's a very important relationship, the writer-director relationship, and ultimately, who who has the final say when it comes to those conflicts? Is it, you know, the person overseeing it or the person creating it? Well, I, I think with all plays, the writer has the final say, um, all, always. That, that they, they have to finally, it's their words on the stage and they, they must have the final say. But uh, what has been a, a joy of, of working with Jason is it's been, um, uh, he's a great tennis player. And when you play tennis with him, you get better. Hmm. And I would suggest that probably I'm a pretty good tennis player for him. Hmm. And so when we bash the, the ball back and forth, we're upping the ante or making the shot more difficult or making the other person run a bit more. And so uh, a, a director in a way is responding not just by criticizing what the scene is or, or analy analyzing the scene, it's actually putting the scene up and showing what's not there, but to the best mm -hmm. of my possible ability to do the scene as written um, so that he can see the scene and then uh, 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 go off. And when you say fraught, well, you know, Jason's pretty hard on himself. And I guess I'm pretty hard right. on myself too, actually. Right. Like he, 
that's where the fraughtness is. It's actually not right, me. Right, you're it's, uh, hard on yourself. And I'm hard on myself and then uh, trying to get it right or trying to get it accurate or trying to get it uh, true, true, right? In, the, in that term of it's all true. What's true of the theater? What's true of the uh, event and moment? And uh, yeah, so if I can get it right and show him what it is, and then I can say, well, this is where it's not enough is coming forward. And then he can step forward and come back with another scene. And it's like remarkable. You know, I go, oh, okay. Well, that re that changed the whole play. I've got to change my entire thinking about what the play is. And then I have to respond. And yeah. it, that's what we bash back and forth. That's that ball going back and forth and suddenly someone hits a slam and you got to get it knocked back. Uh, and then you go, and if you don't, well, you go, mm, okay, I think we got a scene. <laughs> this is it, right? That's, that's the one. So uh, it's, it's, a, it's a very, it's very exciting to be a part of that, a, a part of that process, you know, and, and, and from an actor's perspective, you have to hold true to what's been written and not kind of uh, impose anything because he needs to see what he's written. Yes. And you know. go away and say, oh, wait, that's not working as I've written it. You can't, you can't embellish or fill it in when you're in a workshop situation. You have to show him what he's, you have to be a mirror. And you remember how rigid he was about punctuation and yes. staying tight and no taking, oh, no unnecessary pauses or beats. Like you just yeah. do what's yeah. written in the rhythm yeah. that's written. And that's so illuminating for a writer when the actor does just do it the first time in the, in the, in the rhythm of the piece because then they go oh okay that's where it's flowing oh okay that's where it's getting too long oh that's where i'm doing repeating action i'm doing the same thing again uh in this thing and uh and that's where the rhythm is informing the story i mean it's, it's like a composer a composer has a really clear idea in his head of how the piece sounds and uses all the notation to make sure that musicians bring that. It's, and, and punctuation is the same as musical notation. You know, a writer will hear it in his head, I think, or her head. Absolutely, it's absolutely so critical. I mean, I, all the great writers use punctuation. Uh, yeah. as, they, as, they, as you say, as musical notation to say, this is how you kind of have to say the line. You have to do a shift, yeah. here. you have to take a beat here, you have to take a pause here, or not, or you have to drive it through, it, or you have to overlap. and. Uh, there is music to it, um, and there's music in Jason's writing, um, yep. and he he's got to hear it. It's like the melody. You go, you can't, uh, you can't. If you're singing the tune wrong, you're not playing it right, right? right. And it's not. And again, it's kind of that thing. It's not true. Uh, and it's like sailing a ship when you want to sail true, you know, like you're you want to sail true to, uh, to it. It isn't actually whether it's right or wrong or false or truthful. It's staying true to the wind, the water, and the ship. And you kind of, you have to attack all the time uh, in Jason's place, could deal with all the contradictions, but you have to stay true. So it's funny, he's called the play, It's All True. And do you know when it's not true? I mean, I guess the, the, if you're continuing with the analogy, it's when the boat isn't moving, right? You feel that there's nothing happening. The doldrums, yes. There's no wind, so you just. But that that's true. Suddenly you want to want to be idle. You want a quiet moment. You want a moment when nobody's doing anything. That that's what's meant to be true of that moment in the story. Um, uh, you certainly you can certainly feel like you're repeating action is a common thing, or yeah, you kind of feel like what they're playing is just too simplistic for who they are as human beings what you've written up to that point. And so the next scene is too um, uh, simple, too, too cartoon or too, the lines around the characters are too hard. And I would say that Jason is a layering writer. Like his first drafts are of a scene or are just a kind of sketch. And, and I don't, I can't think of a better word other than the kind of the, the cartoon of the characters. So there are very strong lines around it. There's a very simple action. And he hears it and he goes, okay, now I got to go next step. And I don't know what he hears, but he hears something that says, I got to go the next step and make it richer and make it richer and make it richer. So it's a very accumulating process. And when we get in workshop, myself and the actors doing, suddenly doing it on the stage, he can even go deeper in terms of 
coming to understand the story. So he's inspired very much by the actors. Uh, you know. Well, and it's funny because I remember you say when you get on the stage, it's true. When you get into costume as an actor, when you get on the stage, it comes to life. And I'm sure as the writer, you say, oh my gosh, I have more ideas because I remember getting monologues opening night that I had to memorize, you know, <laughs> yes. or, you know, or scenes that were cut. When you're doing scenes that are like that, that are overlapping, it is just, you know, it's completely stress inducing to have to do a new scene, but you realize it's important. He's, he's, he's seen something in the moment because we're all up on stage in our costumes and more fully embodying our characters. And he's seen something that makes him go, no, this has to change. And it's very, so we all... it's very often something that's not actually on the stage, but is the air around the actors, the space between the, the, the characters, mm. the thing. And that's when he goes, oh, that's missing mm. the space between them. So that's when he writes into that, that material that's the uh, sort of unspoken, unsaid, because you can see the actors only getting to a certain point. It's not true way. enough. Yeah, yeah, no, yeah. it's very, it's, it's his process in both the plays we did, uh, three in the back, two in the head, and uh, it's all true. And subsequent to that, he actually is someone who's trying to write. He starts out just with a sketch. I guess cartoon is not the right word. It's more a sketch, really. And, uh, and he, you never see those scenes again, but they're a beginning. Mm -hmm. him to start on the uh, on the journey of rewriting and rewriting and of course then it put, puts you guys through the um, the ringer right so we rehearsed this afternoon new scene in the before the audience tonight learn your lines run the lines quickly run them again run them again run them again right Take a piece of the brain out that uh, yeah. that was used for that put a new one in <laughs> yes change right. of yeah 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 <laughs> It was a. Did Victor have a new monologue at the end of the play? I, there's no monologue anymore at the end of the play, so it must have gotten cut. Maybe that got cut. Yeah, I, I can't it, remember. I remember little insertions here and there, having to be really aware of. I, you said something funny to me after opening night because I did have we did have some edits to a scene, and I remember you said that my when I came to the edit, my hands went straight. <laughs> <laughs> that was somehow the manifestation of my attempting to, you know, control the gigantic leap that I had to make in my brain. My hands went straight and then I went back to whatever it was I needed to do. The body reacts. Yeah. Like, Hang on, I'm going to do it. I was going to ask, uh, it's not so much about Jason's writing and being inside the play, but I'm, I've always loved the, the uh, per role of a dramaturg. And uh, there's so much history with this play. I remember researching, you know, the, the story about Orson Welles and the Works Progress Administration and how they marched up, uh, I think it was 7th Avenue. And I, I remember I, I, I did a map, uh, you know, from where they started to where they ended. Right. I found club, where Club 21 was. So do you want to talk a little bit about the role of a dramaturg? Do you say dramaturg or dramaturg? I want to know. Say dramaturg, dramaturg, uh, both. Dramaturg. That, uh, eh. I mean, there really are two. There's a production dramaturg, and there's a script dramaturg. I guess the, the, the dramaturg. I'm, I'm changing the pronunciation for no reason. Um, <laughs> but a production dramaturg will do the things you're researching the environment of the play, <clears throat> researching the history, the um, the weather, the locations, the the social historical context anything that's biographical, anything that informed a writer or readings around the writer to provide a kind of cushion for the rehearsal hall uh, to work, right? And for actors to be inspired to draw from or a director or design. Yeah, yeah. It's kind of a bed of information uh, and kind of look at that in relationship to the production. Um, but a script amateur is much more focused on, in a way, trying to uh, get the writer to articulate uh what their goals are in a sense but you never want it to kind of on the money you want to kind of try and find uh the goals without being um specific so the writer feels still free to write if you like keep creating which jason can do naturally but uh uh to open the door for the writer in terms of their thinking and so they're very supportive of the writer, more so than say a director, who's much a little more ruthless, if you like, because they're looking at the production 
and the hit on the audience, where the script dramaturg is trying to cultivate um, the playwright's intentions and then manifest them in terms of a, a liaison. Um, now, you know, in this instance, I played both those roles, uh, director and dramaturg. But I will say the cast, because they were the cast in the workshop and then the cast in uh, the production, um, acted as a dramaturge in many ways because of how they were speaking to how they were playing their part and what their character might or might not do. And I remember it, I think it was, and I do believe it was you, Tamara, and I don't remember exactly what you said, but you talked about uh, Brecht, because Brecht was a character oh, to play, yeah. or Brecht, as they say, uh, as, as we said, Brecht. And uh, he was a character in the play and it, very influential on Mark Blitzstein, so he showed up in Mark Blitzstein's mind. I guess he met him or something and uh, and criticized him for not being Marxist enough or something like that. But you mentioned Brecht and what Brechtianism is or alienation effect. And that to me, in the this was the workshop, was the germination of the idea that when they went into the theater, flashback in the, did all the flashback scenes, that when we were in the theater, we were naturalistic in the theater as the play is set, but when we flash back to the scenes that inform the present day, we went theatrical. And so people were miming cigarettes, smoking, right. so exactly. using theater technique yeah. to evoke those scenes, um, uh, unlike the present day scenes, which were just us in the room with the audience, really. They were, you know, lights were on the audience, lights were on the stage, it wasn't very attractive lighting. It was, you know, uh, rehearsal hall theater lighting, which is ugly, shadowy, and, um, yeah. And just plain, we just, the theater was what it is. We use the side door, we use the fire exit door, we use the fire exit uh, scene, we did a scene in the fire exit, we did a scene in the lobby, we did a scene in the audience and then back out. So we lived in the theater as, the room, as we would use the room. And, uh, but when we went to the play, we suddenly had to be more, when we flash back into the history that informed the scene, we became more theatrical and more Brechtian. And uh, so there's, a, there's an actor uh, <laughs> providing dramaturgical input, more as a production dramaturge, really going this, this reference to the theater, what's true. And so when I remember Martin Julian smoking a cigarette, right, and lighting a cigarette and kind of like, and doing that, I'm going, that's truer than us actually try to light a cigarette. Mm -hmm. That's actually more evocative of what it is to light a cigarette uh, in the ideal sense and to smoke it in the ideal sense mm. uh, than actually worried about uh, uh, making it real, uh, dealing with a lit cigarette, all that kind of stuff you have to deal with, where do the ashes go, where all, you know, all that kind of stuff. This just well, became of the theater. And in some ways it's more real because it demands the audience use its own imagination, much like when you read a book and the, and the images come to your mind off the page. Yeah. You know, I am fascinated. I was thinking this morning about the idea of imagination because this is a play within a play within a play. We're actors in a theater performing for a Toronto audience. We're, we're playing stage managers and directors who are putting on a play and then those certain of the actors have to be, uh, you know, characters within those plays. So there's three layers. And how the heck do you differentiate without the use of, you know, gigantic sets and music to, you know, change an atmosphere? Really, it comes down to imagination you know, the actor's imagination, which then leads the audience's imagination. I'm just fascinated by that. It really is magic. Yeah. You know, and I think yeah. for an audience to go on the journey, the actor has to use the imagination. The director has to has to rely on, you know, the audience's imagination to fill in the blanks. And the brain or, does that. Or a lighting cue that just suddenly says we're in Virginia, their home, Virginia and Orson's home. It's a lighting yeah. cue. It was just, was there even chairs? We just used whatever was in the theater. If we had a chair, I don't think I remember call it, seeing a chair. And the lighting cue changed and suddenly we're in a new location. Sound was there, uh, but it was, uh, it was still a bare stage. And it was just the, the two actors evoking this, right? Very quickly, a turn. Orson would stay in the audience and you'd be on the stage and he'd be talking to you, but it would be in the past tense, right? So you didn't know whether it was the director directing his yeah. life or trying to direct his wife, right, uh, on stage. 
Yeah, and you wouldn't want to, you wouldn't want to try and impose sets or music or anything on it because it was too, it's too involved. You want to see the present and the past working at the same time. Yeah. And only use one little light cue to, to make that shift. I think absolutely hands down the favorite, my favorite moment in the play was when I was in the audience, behind the audience, because I would walk as Jeannie through the audience to be the stage manager. But mm -hmm. then suddenly I would become Virginia in the home speaking to uh, Orson on the stage. And I had this really violent moment where yeah. <laughs> right. I remember that. Yeah. I liked scaring the poop out of the audience, but I yelled at Orson, come home. And I was behind the half of the audience at that halfway point in the theater. And I their shoulders jumped, but there was something so exciting about being inside the theater, like in the middle of the audience, you yeah. know, that made but it even more. Not the stage manager, where you were not supposed to be at a desk yeah. at the theater, yeah. suddenly playing the wife, right? Who's scaring yeah. the guy on stage, right? Yeah. In the so. living room, he's in yeah. the bathroom. Whatever. Yeah. It was an exciting piece that way. Yeah. Um, uh, what I want to also say is that in the play, that's exactly the struggle because you have a, a, a director, Orson Welles, trying to do too much. He's got the wagons going, he's got all these effects, he wants the stage to rock. Uh, and so he's looking for all these uh, SFX that are big and very expensive and very difficult to rehearse and very difficult to coordinate. And eventually that all gets stripped away to a man singing at a piano. That, that's what gets taken away. Costumes get taken away, props get taken away. Wagons. Wagon, your theater gets taken away. Everything that's, uh, that Orson has overdone and takes us right back to the bare stage. So the historical event became our event because we work with the bare stage. And we nice. forced those conditions to work with the bare stage and try and move through many different times and spaces with as little as possible because we did if I did brought on wagons for every scene, it would have destroyed the play. <laughs> it couldn't move that that quickly. And eventually the actors perform the play from the audience as they did in the original thing. They, they couldn't go on stage because there couldn't be an actor's equity to be on stage, but they could stand up in the audience and sing. Yeah. Because they, they were audience members, they weren't actors. So that brings me to this, the, uh, the Works Progress Administration, which is why they had to sit in the audience, right? Because they weren't allowed to perform on stage. So uh, at its peak in 1938, the, the Works Progress Administration in the, in the States provided jobs, paying jobs for 3 million unemployed men and women, uh, most notably under the federal project number one, which employed musicians, artists, writers, actors, and directors in all kinds of artistic endeavors. Um, you know, somebody, somebody brought this up. I think it might have been Ali Momin, so I won't claim it as my own, but given our current circumstances in we're recording this during a pandemic, yeah. um, where our industry is under tremendous strain, um, lots of artists out of work and who have been regularly employed for a long period of time, you know, gratefully many of us received the CERB um, but do you think that our government should be looking to create a similar kind of works progress administration to, you know, to support its artists through this difficult time? Well, that's what I kind of thought the CERB was. In fact, it was supporting people, but it wasn't to make art. It was we weren't working. We're not working. We're just collecting the money. Basic. A basic income, right? The, uh, that they could, people could survive on. So, to some degree, it was that, but it wasn't actually um, uh, creating art. Now, in Canada, um, I mean, we remember we had OFY and LIP when the theaters first started, which were work grants that supported theaters, creating theaters, and totally supported by the government. That's why okay. Toronto Free Theater was Toronto Free Theater, because they didn't have to charge tickets. Oh. We could come to, for free to the theater and because the actors were all paid and all the salaries and whatever the conditions were paid for by government grants. So there were work programs in the 67 and 68 uh, and started many of our theaters. Uh, I don't think started the Tarragon because that started 72, but Pass Marai, Toronto Free, uh, F Factory, all were work, su subsequent work grants and Trudeau's early government, Pierre Trudeau's early government. 
And, and that has led, to, of course, to the Canada Council supporting that and the Ontario Arts Council. And now we have systems where the government does support us in part right. to a degree. But uh, we're now at a time where you, I mean, the problem with now is you can't do anything. We're, we're going to go into another lockdown and we're just uh, right. talking about it today and going, well, we actually can't perform. And so the circumstances are pretty different that we can't um, uh, can't for health reasons, and I think valid health reasons, yeah. not get on the stage. Uh, and we don't want anybody to be harmed by this. So I think the CERB program was pretty great. And uh, uh, I guess I guess I was thinking something along the lines of having maybe supporting artists to pivot temporarily, you know, to support to supplement teaching, you know, because artists would make great teachers to pay artists to learn to teach drama online or if you want time to think that through, right? I mean, it's like, uh, you need to realize the Great Depression is going on. Yeah. To realize, oh, we better do something now, right? Is the pandemic going to go on or not? I mean, we're, and, you know, the vaccine helps, right? To the, the nature of the, the illness and the solutions that are before us, it's hard to predict whether this will continue on or not just yet. So it's kind of hard, I think, for the government to take action that way right now. I do think that if they provided a basic income, that would be, I think, that, I think that's actually a solution for all time. That's true. Yeah. You know, I just think everybody should get served. And if you, when you pay your taxes, you, you count that in as part of your income and you go, oh, you got to pay that back, this amount of back if you're, it's, I, to me, it's the simplest process. I don't even know sure why we have welfare. Just everybody should get 2000 bucks a month. Right. And, um, and no, I signed the petition. Yeah. Um, all right, back to it's all true then. Uh, as we wrap up, what are some of your favorite memories? Well, that first scene is a great blistering scene. Yeah. Uh, and uh, it was always, uh, as every time I was in the audience, I was going, okay, is it going to crash? Someone going to forget a line? Is someone going to jump a person, jump a queue? And how do they, how do they get out of survive it? So Train goes off the rails. A race, right? As fast as you can, with as, be, to be as accurate as you can. And I knew those guys were in the lobby rehearsing it just before they walked on. Ran it again, ran it again, ran it again. Well, I was going to say, you made us warm up with that scene every night. That yeah. was a requirement for us. Yes, yeah. yeah, so, so that we could get get on the train. Yeah. It was that. It's that. It was that difficult. And then, of course, you the uh, later on the rehearsal scene, where you go long scenes rehearsing, but you go through all these various different locations and times, and uh, and uh, you're jumping around. It's one continuous scene. So you're going to Orson Welles's home. You're going to see finding Virginia with a lover that she's taken. You're going to Club Twenty One. You're jumping to a Howard scene with uh, with Olive. You're doing a Blitzstein scene with Hausman. You're leaping around, but it's one rehearsal. And Orson's trying to rehearse Olive and being driven crazy by uh, her not able to get it. And uh, it, everything's carried on that. You've got to get it right. You've got mm -hmm. to. Uh, or you'll lose the audience. Or you'll lose it. And it's this pursuit of the truth he's trying to get. Meanwhile, he's haunt, being informed by all these messages from his life uh, ab about how it should be true. And he's using his life in the scene to try to get all of to act it right. Uh, but in a way, he's trying to get his life right. And so uh, there's that kind of juggling act. And sometimes, I mean, all, well, all too often, you I find that what's happening in the play I'm doing is actually what's happening in my life. And, <laughs> uh, okay, right. There's a, you know, so uh, uh, the, the struggle of the director to get it right with an actor is informed by all these life issues that are coming into the rehearsal hall. And of course your life changes and then you walk in the rehearsal hall and the scene's changed and it gets mm. deeper and better. Or someone tells something or something happens right that kind of informs it makes it go richer i love that scene and because we're all human and that's what happens right so that's like when you're saying when genie's in the audience the stage managers in the audience talking and then suddenly you switch to virginia and uh it, you just flip on a dime 
um, and you know, basically it's an accent, maybe a hat, and uh, you're you're into the thing, you're moving that quickly through like a almost a collage. Brilliant scene, the rehearsal hall scene. It might be my most favorite part of of my career as an actor was the opportunity to switch from a New York stage manager who was like really you know down to earth and practical to you know a, uh, this sophisticated wife of Orson to his yeah. mother, which he was originally in the in the play. Uh, yeah. I love that. That was just that was so exciting. Yeah, to be and then, you know, the audience is just wanting to keep up, right? You're just keeping up. You're actually, you don't, you don't tell them you're moving in time and space. You just do. And they have to catch up. They have to stay at a pace, which is kind of the pace of madness, right? Orson's going mad as his life's yeah. falling apart and the play's falling apart uh, because it's too complex. He's made it too complex and he's uh, uh, falling apart. And uh, the rhythm of that scene is a person is going mad. And I think it's, mm. it captures that quite beautifully um, mm -hmm. as the artist struggles to kind of get to the truth. And it, you kind of have to go mad sometimes. We all went mad with you. <laughs> yes, we all went mad, yeah. It was a great group of actors and it was wonderful to rehearse yeah. again. Uh, and it was really a pleasure to go back and re-record it. I mean, I don't envy Chris Tolley to have to edit and put it put together all of those cutoff sentences. My God, I, wow. I mean, I can't wait to see how he does it. But it was a great, and uh, we had a little uh, party afterwards, and um, it was great to revisit. Lots of lots of great laughs. It was like we're back in the green room again. I know. It like we're back like in the green room. Past. Yeah, it's it's interesting how our body. And our voice and I guess our soul remembers. Like you guys were so honest and true when you did the lines. And like you you didn't, I didn't really have to rehearse, I had to make an adjustment, but you were organic to the piece as you were on closing night. Well, yeah. we had to adjust to the size because of course we're no longer in a big theater. Yeah. But we had to capture whatever it was that we did back 20 years ago and put it into a little microphone. <laughs> Same time, it was just like dialing down the volume. Just dial down. Yeah. You, you, you're, you're absolutely truthful. You just have to talk <laughs> now versus project it, right? And uh, uh, so, yes, that's that's probably the the greatest adjustment. But it still, in the end, turned out to be just like you said it before, only mm -hmm. just you know just smaller. It, it, it was all true. It was very true. <laughs> that feels like a good place to end. Yes, thank you, Tamara. Thank, Thank you. So you. Pleasure. That was it's wonderful. My great pleasure, everybody, you know, to work, have worked with Tamara for, I won't say how many years, but many, many years. And uh, it's great to be interviewed by you. Uh, and uh, uh, once again, a joy, and we'll do it again. Okay. I hope so. Okay.